All right, scholars, thanks for tuning in. We're going to take a look here at environmental health and toxicology. This presentation will help you understand environmental health hazards, environmental health goals, and synthetic and natural toxicants. So what does this word mean? Environmental health assesses environmental factors that influence human health and quality of life. So we're seeking to prevent adverse effects on human health and, eco and ecological systems. What are some health hazards? Well, we have synthetic and natural toxicants. These are only one type of environmental health threat. So we think of these as like chemical pollution. But others are physical hazards. They could be floods or blizzards or landslides. Radon, which is a radioactive gas that can seep into the basements of homes. UV exposure from the sun. There can be chemical hazards like disinfectants and pesticides. There can be biological hazards, including viruses and bacterial infections. And cultural or lifestyle hazards like drinking and smoking and bad diet and crime in neighborhood. So there's um, some examples of specific environmental hazards for air. You have smoke, um, automobile exhaust, industrial pollution, Tropospheric ozone, which is ozone that you would experience if you were in LA or some other smoggy area. Pesticide drift from their spraying on one field and it drifting over, over to another. Dust and particulate matter. These are all things that could affect someone's lungs. And then there's water hazards. Pesticide and herbicide runoff. Nitrates and fertilizer runoff. Mercury, arsenic, and other heavy metals in groundwater and surface water. All these that can make water contaminated. When we look at food, there can be natural toxins within food. Um, there can also be pesticide and herbicide residues. And indoors, we find hazards like asbestos, which is something that they use in the construction of homes that um, reduces their flammability, making them better able to resist fire. Radon, as I mentioned, lead in paint and pipes. Most, almost all lead that you buy now is lead-free, but that wasn't true in the 70s. So. If you have a home that's older, it might still have lead paint. And there can be toxicants and plastics in consumer products. Sometimes if you smell a new product, um, like a new electronic device, you can smell that there's, there's gases coming off. And those are um, usually toxic gases. So let's take a look first at infectious diseases. In communicable or transmissible disease, a pathogen attacks a host. So these two words here, communicable and transmissible, mean a disease that can get transferred from one person to another. And it can do this either directly or through a vector. A vector is something that carries the pathogen. So mosquitoes can transfer malaria from one person to another. So the mosquito is the vector. And the pathogen can be transmitted from one host to another directly. So if you have, um, uh, so for example, um, an intravenous drug user, might transfer AIDS from their blood directly to the blood of another person who is sharing their needle. Infectious disease causes 25% of deaths in the world and nearly half of deaths in developing nations. So this is a pretty major hazard. And we can see here, um, you don't have to know these details, but um, infectious diseases are about 25%. Cardiovascular diseases like having a heart attack or a stroke comprise about 30% of deaths. Um, and cancer, obviously another big one. And uh, you can see here that infectious diseases, the most common one are respiratory diseases. Influenza, you know, you might have gotten the flu and been really sick for that, but a lot of people who are, might be elderly will die from the flu. Pneumonia, of course AIDS, um, diarrheal diseases, um, like there's one called typhoid fever that can be very serious. Tuberculosis, which is a, a lung disease malaria, a blood disease, and then childhood diseases like measles and pertussis or whooping cough, things like that. These all are, these are the six big types of infectious disease that people die from. So um, I want to touch base on the West Nile virus, which is also called bird flu, because it's been in the news in the last um, few years. It's transmitted from infected birds to humans via mosquitoes. Those are the vector and it causes flu-like symptoms. And it's not necessarily fatal for people who are generally in good health, but for people whose health is compromised, it can be. We can see it spread through this country, starting in Northeast, 
uh, New England area, 1999, and most recently, 2004, in green, over here in Oregon. And um, the, the greatest number of cases was in 2003, but we see that in 2004 um, it has decreased. So we've, we've managed to keep it at bay. Let's take a look now at indoor health hazards. Substances in plastics and consumer products, they can um, give off toxic chemicals. Lead in paint and pipes, radon, asbestos, fire retardants. So um, we kind of touched base on all those already. But you find these in carpets of homes. You find it in the insulation that's used in the walls of homes. You find it in the paint and walls. The pipes can have lead, and as the water flows through, it can pick up that lead. And if you drink it, you could be um, bringing lead into your system. So by toxicology, we're looking at um, a we're looking at the toxicity of these chemicals. It is the study of poisonous substances and their effect on humans and other organisms. Toxicologists assess chemicals, also called toxicants in this case, because they can cause health problems, for their toxicity, the degree of harm a substance can inflict. And the word environmental toxicology, that means the study that's focusing on effects of chemical poisons released into the environment. So let's take a look at that. Environmental toxicology studies toxicants that come from or are discharged into the environment and their effects on humans, animals, and ecosystems in general. Often animals are studied either for their own welfare, like studying um, the condor because they were being affected by DDT, or we can use these birds as canaries in a coal mine to warn of effects on humans. Some animals showing signs um, before humans would show signs. So synthetic chemicals is, um, is what we're talking about with most of these toxic materials. And there have been about 100,000 synthetic chemicals on the market today. And very few have been thoroughly tested for harmful effects. So let's take a closer look at this. These chemicals are everywhere. Over 100,000 have been produced and released. About 700 are introduced each year as new chemicals that the world has never seen before. Some persist for long time periods or travel great distances. In a 2002 um, U.S. Geological Society study showed that 80% of U.S. streams contain up to 82 wastewater contaminants, including antibiotics, perfumes, detergents, drugs, steroids, disinfectants, etc. Just think about antibiotics. If you've ever taken antibiotics, when you urinate, those antibiotics go into, um, into the toilet, into the sewer system, and into our waterways. Even perfumes and detergents, when you bathe, these products that you apply to your skin go into the water, and that water eventually ends up in our, in our waterways. Um, drugs, same thing, any kind of drug that you're taking. And um, steroids for whatever reason, disinfectants, etc. So you don't have to know these specific numbers here, but just to give you a sense for the, um, the large number of chemicals that we're talking about here. These are the number of chemicals in commercial substances during the 1990s. Estimated, as I said, about 100,000 chemicals, 72,000 of them industrial chemicals used for manufacturing. 2,000 were introduced per year back in the 90s. Um, we said 700 earlier. Um, 600 pesticides, which so far we have about 21,000 different types of pesticides that we produced. Food additives, you know, you think about food coloring and food preservatives, things like that. Cosmetic ingredients used for making, making um, yeah, cosmetics, makeup, and then human pharmaceuticals, huge number. So this rise of synthetic chemicals really started in the mid-1900s after World War I, sorry, World War II. Then we saw widespread synthetic chemical production begin. And this here, you see a picture of the potent insecticide DDT being sprayed in, uh, on a beach in New York. So it was used widely in public areas. And th this woman here, Rachel Carson, wrote, this her, wrote her famous book, Silent Spring, in 1962. And this book alerted the public that DDT and other pesticides could be toxic to animals and people. It's one of the first, aware, first um, times of being aware that these chemicals actually have a toxicity that we need to be seriously concerned about. Further research on her studies led the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, to ban DDT in 1973. And these developments were central to the modern environmental movement. She's kind of, um, uh, she was a pioneer, really, in getting us to understand 
the need to systematically study the environment to protect it. So there are several different types of toxicants, all these chemicals that we're talking about. Some can be carcinogens, which means they cause cancer. And you do need to know all these terms. Mutagens are chemicals that cause mutations in DNA. So it might change an adenine to a guanine or a thymine to a cytosine, and that may lead to cancer. There are teratogens, which are chemicals that cause birth defects. And usually these chemicals are affecting a developing fetus inside of the mother's womb. And it's during that, um, that development stage where these chemicals can alter the development. And we'll see a graphic example of that in a moment. Um, well, not graphic, but um, uh, tragic. Neuroallergens, oh, that's anything that causes an unnecessary immune response. If you have allergies, there's a protein getting into your body or some chemical getting into your body that your body feels it needs to defend itself from. So it goes into an immune response. You have an overproduction of mucus and, um, and uh, tears and things like that in your eyes. Neurotoxins are chemicals that damage the nervous system. And there are many um, types of, well, many heavy metals like mercury can be neurotoxins. And endocrine disruptors. These are pretty large, complicated um, molecules that interfere with hormones that make our body function and operate properly. So check out this, um, this person here. This person was a victim of the drug thalidomide, which is used to relieve nausea during pregnancy. It turned out to be a potent teratogen and caused thousands of birth defects before being banned in the 1960s. So we use these chemicals without knowing that it was going to cause babies to be deformed as they were born. And they, we call them, they're, they're referred to as flipper babies because their arms are very, their arms are basically non-existent. It's just um, a partial hand. So thalidomide baby, Butch Bumpkin, learned to overcome his deformed arms and fingers to become a professional tennis instructor. This is a good case where the um, precautionary principle would have been good. We decided to use this drug and, um, and only stop using it when we find out that it's bad, as opposed to testing it first to see if it was going to be safe and then deciding whether we would use it or not. So let's take a look at endocrine disruptors. Um, we can see here, well, let's say some chemicals once inside the bloodstream can mimic hormones. So a hormone is a molecule that attaches to receptor molecules in the cell walls, and that initiates some kind of response by the cell. But some molecules have the same basic shape, that they are also able to um, fit that receptor and cause an identical response. So if molecules of the chemical bind to the sites intended for hormone binding, they cause an inappropriate response, and thus these chemicals disrupt the endocrine hormone system. So here's one example of a chemical that is an um, endocrine disruptor. It's called bisphenol A. And it received a lot of attention a few years ago because it is a component used to make plastic water bottles, the kind that are sort of um, a hard plastic, a hard clear plastic, a number seven usually. And so they found that the shape of bisphenol A is, um, is similar enough to estrogen, the female sex hormone, that it can mimic it in the body. So even though these molecules are not the same, they share some essential features. What is similar about these two molecules? You know, we see here a CH3 and then over here an OH. And here we see a CH3 and over here an OH. Um, so somehow this is able to lock into those receptors in the same way that estrogen, estrogen is. So this idea here is that the hormone system is geared to working with tiny concentrations of hormones. These are chemicals that flow, that are produced by our body. They flew, flow through our bloodstream to other parts of our body to cause growth changes or things like that. So because it's geared to working with tiny concentrations, it can respond to tiny concentrations of environmental contaminants. So have chemicals in the environment acted as endocrine disruptors in humans? Well, let's take a look at this, declining sperm counts. Studies, uh, a 1992 study, summarized results of sperm count studies worldwide since 1938. And the trend is that uh, people around the world are, for the last 60 or so years, have decreased their sperm count, leading to cases of male infertility. So this this um, you know this can be alarming that there is um, something going on with our endocrine system to cause changes like that. 
We also see a rise in testicular cancer. Other studies suggest that endocrine disruptors are behind the rise in this um, cancer in many nations, 1960 to 1990. So, you know, this is where a lot of these chemicals really started coming into existence. So, what we're looking at here are correlations that, okay, we've used, been using some of these chemicals and we see rise in these, um, these rates of uh, disease. Is there a connection between them? Possibly. What is that connection? We don't know, but we can see that they are cor correlated to each other. Um, so, there might be a link. I'd like you to take a moment and summarize some of the things that we've discussed here, and then check out um, notes 6.5, um, where we'll take a little bit closer look at toxicology.